So much it's so fun to be here this is my um, first time to ever be here and I think I have as much staff with me as there are of you so we're a pretty balanced team here but it's really good to be here and I appreciate the opportunity I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about DCFS and the work that we are doing because I think the work of this department is phenomenal and that we have some really incredible people Many of you covered the transition team report that began the um, Edwards administration. And every, you know, every, he used his transition teams for um, basically a case review of the department. And so every department was evaluated, looked at from outside, inside eyes, and then a report was given to him. Of all the transition team reports, the one on DCFS was the most damning, and it was accurate. DCFS suffered greatly under the general administration. We lost um, 2,000 staff. Our workforce in child welfare, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today, is really down about 30%. Now, the caseload has not gone down. We don't have fewer children or families that we're caring for but we have 600 less people to do that work. So the transition team had two or three really important key things in, in it. One of it was fully fund DCFS. Now nobody categorized what fully fund DCFS is or was or is, but I take that as my favorite one and remind the governor often that that was what the team said, that we need to be fully funded. The main things that we tackled right away that the transition team highlighted was that in 2010, during the general administration, they reorganized the department. They took away the offices. You know, every department has the Office of Behavioral Health or Mental Health or Substance Abuse. Um, in DCFS, we had the Office of Child Welfare and the Office of Family Support. And in order to downsize government and streamline government and make the organization flatter with less management or heavy, top heavy structure, the organization was flattened and all just, I don't know a better word than just mashed together, which is kind of scrambled so that you had people that were eligibility workers, people that knew food stamps and child support enforcement that were then supervising or being supervised by somebody with a child welfare background and vice versa. So the first thing, which made no sense, there, there's no structural integrity in that, there is no um, way to support the expertise and the talent and the skill and the ability and the years of experience that people put into that work on either side to make that structure make sense. It was purely a political gimmick to make the department look differently. What it did, however, was damage families. So the first thing we did when we came in the door and literally the very first day had I known how hard this was, I probably would not have been quite as bold about it, but I kind of came in with this thou shalt restructure kind of mentality, and it was the first thing we wanted to do. It's taken us over a year to actually untangle those two groups, and we don't have offices anymore because those were taken away, and that's fine, but now we have a division of child welfare and a division of family support so that you have the expertise, the knowledge, and the skill of child welfare back together being supervised by people with that talent skill. Same on the other side of the house. So we were able to do that. We were also able, and this is an ongoing thing that we'll be working on forever, is boosting the morale of our employees. Our employees had been treated horribly. People were afraid to speak up. They were afraid to tell the truth. They were afraid to talk back. I, I, I'm stunned at the um, hurt and PTSD and trauma that I walked into. 
Remember, as Kevin said, I have been here under Governor Blanco, and I knew what the Child Welfare Agency looked like. I, I knew what that staff was like. I knew their qualifications. I knew the morale. I knew the team spirit. I knew that we'll do anything we have to to protect a child mentality that permeated child welfare. And I won't say it was gone because it wasn't, because the only people still left were people that were so dedicated that they wouldn't leave. But what we lost was huge historical and institutional knowledge and deep expertise in child welfare. Child welfare is hard work. You are determining the life of a child. And a child is only two once in their life. And if at two, you're taken away from your family and put somewhere else, that's a trauma deep in those little bones. And while that brain is developing, that trauma is in there. And if that's not treated well and managed right, that trauma lives forever. It doesn't matter if the child comes out of care at three or five or 10. Well, it does matter how long they're in care but it matters more that the trauma is being treated. So not just anybody can walk in off the street and do this work. And the morale of the people that have been doing the work was just damaged. There's no other way to say it. So we have worked every single day to do little things to help staff feel like they are valued. It is ironic to me that by saying hello to somebody in the elevator, by just smiling at people as you walk down the hall and just being humane and human and kind has created a difference. It so permeates this building that our executive team talks regularly about how we're doing in that part of the work. It became one of our main focuses and we had no idea that that would be something we would have to tackle. We were thinking practice, policy. <clears throat> we weren't thinking staff morale. But we made a big dent in it, and people are happy, and people are smiling, and people are beginning to trust and feel like they have some champions because they've seen us fight, and they've seen us stand up and tell the truth again. And we didn't get fired. And amazingly, you can stay and do your job and tell the truth. And that is one thing that I admire so much about this governor is that he says, Marquita, just tell the truth. The chips will fall where the chips will fall, but just tell the truth. And so we've been able to do that without any fear in our agency. But what we've not been able to do is replace the 600 people that we need working in the front lines on child welfare. Our caseloads have not gone down. Let me be abundantly clear, they have gone up. We have about the same number of kids in foster care as we had eight, 10 years ago, roughly around 4,000 on any given day. But the number of families that we're serving in the family services part of that work, which is where we're working with you in your home, we're not removing the child. We've been called in to do an investigation. We know there's something going on in the house. We need to do something, but we've decided that it doesn't rise to the level of abuse where the child has to be removed, so it's neglect. And so we're gonna work with the parents. In those cases, we have to be in that house at least three times a month, and usually more often than that. So that caseload standard is higher than a foster care caseload because we know the foster parents. We've got a track record with them. We know what kind of kid they can handle. We know what their um, family stability is. So the standard to see children in foster care is once a month. Now we always see them more than that because we're going to court, we're going to school, we're doing other things with them. But the standard in family services is higher and we have a couple of thousand kids on any given day in family services. So the total number of kids we're caring for is more than the six to 7,000 range. And did you hear me? We lost 600 people. Do the math. You cannot do the quality work that you need to do when your caseload is that high. 
which is why we are here and talking about this today, turnover is killing us. I'm going to give you a press release and a handout with some numbers um, at the end of this so you'll have this data. But our, our caseload is high and we, that causes turnover in our staff because they have no work-life balance. They can't get to their own family because they're serving the family that they need. So we just got, we applied for a, a national workforce grant from a new um, national center on workforce development created by the feds, and the feds are um, the Children's Bureau, the administrative, uh, Administration of Children, Youth, and Families inside the DHH, and or DHS. And we were one of eight sites selected. We are thrilled, we are tickled to death. What they're gonna bring to us is time, talent, resources, and it's a research grant. The feds do a great job, and we as a nation do a great job of researching what's happening with children, what's best in policy, what's best practice. But we've never done any real research on staffing and um, what different staffing protocols might look like. We are looking now at a kind of a medical model of a nurse that the patient doesn't leave, but the nurses change. So why couldn't we have two child welfare workers carrying the same case, one's working it during the day and one's working it during the night? Why don't we have a night shift? We're a first responder. We're just like firemen and policemen. They go out 24 hours a day, so do we. In fact, a lot of our calls come at nights and weekends. And so if you're a, a worker, a state employee, who's supposed to go home at four o'clock and you get called out on a case at three, guess what? You don't go home at four. There's nobody to turn it over to. You carry that case all the way through the night and maybe deep into the night and maybe into the next day and you have to go to court and you haven't gone to bed yet. So we've got to figure out how to manage this caseload with the 600 less people than we need. So we're looking at all different kinds of strategies. We're doing workforce training. We are looking at hiring different kinds of people. Maybe we need people with more experience. Maybe we need people that come from a same mission-driven kind of concept like the military or teachers. And so we're looking at all these things and we'll be exploring those with this workforce grant. It's for five years. It's not money. It's research on what we do and it's um, technical assistance, people that will be coming in, being experts, pulling in the people we need to look at these things. For example, <clears throat> we have a woman from Texas that is starting with us, I think it's this week, that is, um, Texas has gone to a shift work kind of model with their child welfare workers where they have more than one person working a case so there's somebody covering at night, somebody covering in the day. So we've already brought her in. That's paid for by the Casey Foundation because we don't have the resources in our budget to pay for it ourselves. And that's another reason we're so excited to have this workforce grant. It's free to us. Um, it's all federal dollars that they will get. So we are thrilled about the opportunity. We're announcing this grant today. It really, we actually have the first phone call with them tomorrow. So we're really a day ahead of the big formal um, thing from the feds that we got the grant. Your um, handout tells you all the other eight sites too. It was highly competitive, by the way. We went through weeks and months. The application process was pretty strenuous and then they spent a day on site with us. And um, it was pretty intense. You really felt like you were applying for something. So we also have a brand new video that we are, um, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to get people to understand what this job is and what kind of qualifications you might need to come do this work. So we've just commissioned this video and you are the very first people to see it. Our staff hasn't even seen it. So I think we're at that time and then I'll take questions after. Most people don't know what my job means. From the outside, it's hard to know the challenges and maybe even harder to see the rewards. But our work is a means to a much greater end. One that sees families reunited and the traumatized and neglected kept safe. 
making a difference in our communities starts with us. And making that positive change happen looks different every day. For those children in need, it is people like me who work to protect them. My coworkers and I hold the line between the helpless and those who do them harm. We go to work for them alongside the first responders, whether it's day or night. Our work never stops. We are their courage when they need it. The ones who are brave when they're weak. We are their reason for hope. mistakes that bring families into my care do not define them, but rather present an opportunity to provide support. It doesn't always look like support in the beginning. It always starts out hard, sometimes harder than we ever imagined it could be. But our duty is to take a stand for children who are hurting and to see to their care, to guide and support them no matter the distance, no matter the time of night or day, no matter the struggles we'll have to endure. Working to see them live to their full potential is our charge to families in need. Maybe one day we can hope for the world to be perfect. But until that day comes, we have work to do. We have needs to do. We have schedules to keep, reports to file, miles to travel, and witness to bear. We all witness a lot of things, some of which we don't want to know. Taking on these challenges is the first step to lifting up the people need to help a child we work to strengthen the family. It's the most important thing we can do. We're the bridge between darkness and the brighter days ahead. There's a thing anyone who's serious about making a difference needs to believe. And that's the value of everyone. Not just everyone, but everyone. You have to know that everyone carries with them some type of inherent worth. And that's what keeps us going as we help each other through the hardships of our work. This work carries with it a powerful equation, believing in the less fortunate, then supporting them with love and guidance, and watching them begin to thrive under our care. And eventually, leave that care in a place that didn't exist before we entered their lives. part of this equation is that it helps us grow too so we can better care for our loved ones and appreciate how truly fortunate we are. Most people don't know what my job means but I am proud to say I am a child welfare professional at the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services. If you care about children and families there's a place for you CFS. Visit us online to learn more. I know that was hard to hear. I'm sorry we couldn't get the volume up. Um, I'm happy to take questions, and if you want the link to the video, we can send them. Oh, it's right there. That's the link. And you want to do the press release and the little handout thing? We've, we've got some things for you. Yes, Ms. Sue. Ms. Marquita. Is this video designed for recruiting at, say, job fairs, or is it designed for recruiting through our colleges and universities that are training the workers? Is it going to be broadcast at um, K 
conventions, how are you going to utilize that? Because it's longer than your typical 30. Right. She's asking how we're going to use the recruitment video and um, if we're going to do it at job fairs or with colleges. We're definitely going to use it with our social work colleges and um, human service kind of organizations. We're also, we are going to use it at job fairs. We're going to use it everywhere we can think of. One, one exciting thing we're doing is we're working with our Office of Veterans Affairs and we're going to use it with them. We have a lot of veterans that work for us that are excellent caseworkers. And so we've decided why not go straight there and try to recruit um, from the, the veterans organization. So we're working um, with Secretary Strickland and they will have this. And anywhere you can think of that it might go, please let us know because we want it to be widespread. We know it's a little long. Um, but we were trying to get the message out. It's more than a 30-second, hey, we're DCFS. We really are trying to show the depth of the work. Yes, so how many people on staff right now? Right now, in child welfare, we have 1,226, I think. Okay, so you're down from 600. This is from seven years ago? This is from the end of... Um, or the first year of the blank, the first year of the Jindal administration, we did not lose any staff. I was there for that first year. The staff cut started in the second year. Um, so was that 08, 09? And we were um, 1,800 when I was here before. I had 1,800 child welfare staff, and now we're down to 1,200. So this research grant is going to be good for like five years. You it's said? a five-year commitment. Okay. So when do you think changes are actually going to happen within the staff? Well, we've already seen a lot of change. We haven't seen new people, um, and the turnover rates are killing us, especially in Baton Rouge region. This is our highest turnover rate at 50%, five zero, half our workers leave because they get in, they're six months in, they've got a partial caseload. At the end of that six months, they start transitioning. So by the time they've been there nine or 10 months, they've got a full caseload and it cripples them and they leave. So, yes, so far. Are, are the entry level wages uh, prohibitive in attracting people? Absolutely, you can make as much stocking, morning stock at Costco as you can working for DCFS. Our entry rate is under 30000 It's about $28,000 $28, a year for an entry level worker. Right. So this, this man first, and then I'll come to you with that. So my question is on caseworker productivity. Mm -hmm. So the video showed a caseworker who was walking into a house, walking out of the house, and the house had a restroom. Clearly not simple, not a desk. Clearly. Paperwork. Technology disabled. That's a great term. We, yes, I will. I will try to summarize his question. I will not try to repeat it. But he's asking how much time is staff actually with clients and in the office doing the paperwork, the tech, you know, into trying to get reports and things done. We spend a lot of time in the office. Um, we spend more time with families. We have five five antiquated child welfare systems that do not talk to each other. So one of our requests of the legislature this year was $2 million to get us started into a technology, um, it's called a CWIS, it's Child Welfare Implement System something. That's the federal standard that we're supposed to have. We got that $2 million and it literally starts the work of trying to figure out how to get our data out of all of these systems that don't talk to each other so they can be woven into one that will, so that we cut the paperwork technology behind the computer work down. And we're also using, when you're talking about the efficiency, I also ask about the efficiency of staff. We're looking at, could we have a 
trainee level person that was partnered with not one to one because we don't have that kind of money but maybe one to five workers where they could do some of the data entry and leave the worker in the field and the courtroom because you saw the court scene we're in court a lot and you have to sit and wait for your case to be called and they're not done on time so you might get there at eight o'clock and your case may be called at three so you spent all day sitting in the courtroom waiting for your time so we're looking at everything possible we've asked judges that would give us we know they can't give us a time to dock it but if they could just give us a morning or an afternoon that would be very productive to just split it into morning i'm going to be in the morning docket or the afternoon docket so we're looking at every single thing we can think of that will help build the efficiency with the workforce we've got because we know we're not going to get 600 more people we're not expecting that and one of the things we're doing to try to bring the community into the work is with Louisiana Fosters that many of you covered just, uh, gosh, it feels like a year ago, but it was just about a month and a half maybe, when the First Lady launched the Louisiana Foster Initiative, which is blending our quality parenting, how we recruit, retain, and treat, and partner with foster parents, how we marry the community, faith-based, um, community like nonprofits to help support foster parents so that the work of supporting foster parents goes out so that we're all raising we're all the village we're all raising these kids and lets the workers spend more time with the child doing the social work that they're supposed to do and then I bet you had Well, everybody, you know, well, we're looking for a college degree. We prefer a social work degree, but there are multiple levels. You can come in at a trainee or a social worker one or two, depending on your experience. But we're looking for people with that kind of background, humanities background, social work preferably, or, um, but we take related degrees. We are looking, everybody has to have a background check, which is pretty extensive if you're going to be working with kids. You have to have criminal history clearance and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was just wondering whether uh, the training people would be appropriate uh, background to take some jobs too, if there's looking at that as part of this research. Yeah, it's easier for us. You know, mostly we used to always focus on kids coming straight out of college. We wanted that bachelor's level social worker. And now as we look at our workforce and see how well our older workers are doing, we're going looking for people that have retired early and are still ready to wanting to work, like teachers or um, the military. Like I said, we know that both of those fields work really well in, in our agency. So we're going to really be looking at that. And, and one final thing. So, so United Way campaign is kicking off, and there are a lot of United Way agencies She's asking how United Way or other nonprofits integrate with us. It's a really good question because we've been exploring the option of can we use their dollars as the match for some of our programs if to draw down more federal dollars. Um, we think that's possible in a couple of areas. We have not actually done it yet, but we have a couple of United Ways that have approached us about that. For populations like youth aging out, that that's a population that they work with, with these kids that are unfortunately, and hopefully this won't last much longer, hopefully we'll find the silver bullet that will stop that and no child will ever leave our custody without a permanent connection. But what we know has been true in the past and is true all over the nation is that children get stuck in the system and they don't, and, and, and we fail. They leave us without a family. And I just can't think of anything worse a society can do to a child than have it age out of the system with nowhere to go. And in our very first road trip this year, I met a young woman who, uh, came to our community meeting and had walked out of the door of the child welfare agency signing her last papers leaving us and walked down the street to the homeless shelter it broke my heart 
I mean, we got to do better than that. We've got to do better than that. Yes. Okay, so you make a video, you're trying to recruit people to work for you, mm -hmm. but if there hasn't been any changes and the caseload still so much, I guess, when are things going to change so people would want to come work? <laughs> well, I think you come work because you're called right. to this work. I don't think you come because you think you're going to get a magic caseload standard. There, I, I just don't think that's appropriate. And I think we disabuse people of that notion if that is what they're coming into. I think they learn very quickly that this work is hard and there is no silver bullet to that. I can't go hire 600 people. I can't go hire 100 people. The budget just doesn't allow it. And now we're facing this you know, nightmare of a fiscal cliff. And so who knows what we're gonna look like in six months or eight months. The truth is that we're just gonna keep plugging away and trying to figure out anything we can do that will make a difference. Any little tweak that we can make where we can make it. We just got money for our fleet. Our cars were killing us, literally, with people breaking down on the side of the road. At least now we're getting a fleet that will work that you won't have to worry about that and lose all that time. So if we can improve the technology, and we can improve the tools that we give our people to work with, hopefully that will lessen the burden of time that they are taking to do the work. I have one question over here. What are some of best practices around the country? You mentioned the shift working, maybe a change that you're looking at, but what are some other agencies doing that you may be able to do without hiring additional Well, one thing, the, the question is what other options are there for us um, in shift work or different best practices around the country that we could use. Our rate of substance exposed newborns has tripled over the past, I don't know how many years, seven, since, since 2008, it's tripled. So we went from having around 500 children a month, do we have, I mean a year, to 1,200 babies born addicted. We're putting a staff person, we're gonna start with Woman's Hospital, so this is a best practice, that we are going to create a specialty and a hospitaler, if you like, that we're gonna have a staff person at the hospital to address those babies as they're born, because this, and it needs to be a very high level social worker, because understanding the medical side of substance abuse and withdrawal these babies have a lot of issues coming out of the womb if they have been addicted to something inside the womb. And so we are looking for working with women's um, and, and creating this position, have somebody that literally will be staffed at women's hospital. I don't know yet if that'll be 24 seven or just a day shift. We haven't worked out all the details but trying to just take that burden off the staff if you build that expertise and that knowledge and have somebody right on site immediately will cut down on some of the top priority calls that are calling people out and taking them away from other cases. Yes, sir. You talked about uh, spending a ton of money for new cars. Are you going to reach out to the founders of Uber and the other uh, companies to give you some money and advertise their services at the same time and <laughs> save some money for the people who really need them. So, um, thank you. Somehow I can't see our social workers driving up in an Uber to take a child when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and they're going to be there, you know, for how they have no earthly idea how long. I won't say we spent a ton of money. For us it felt like a lot of money, but um, in actuality, compared to the rest of our budget, the cars were not that expensive. I have two questions here and then here. Yes, you first. Okay. Uh, there have been several recent news talking about features on uh, WDLA and also Brittany Weissman Channel 2 about adoption scams. And when I say scams, I mean behind the scenes bidding wars that have taken place with multiple families competing for the same child. The victims of these scams are very frustrated. Uh, and saying that they don't know where to go. Jeff Landry has gone on record as saying, pursue this thing simply, I'm not going to deal with it. Uh, so can you give any guidance to, and, and at least in one instance, the gentleman blames it on a lack of oversight by BCFS in monitoring the contracted social worker who he claims had a blatant conflict between two of the different couples uh, that were adopting. Basically, can you? When I read the statute, it looks like y'all's role could be nothing more than just accepting affidavits, and maybe I'm wrong. 
can you give any guidance to these people as to what you would suggest that they do when they encounter this sort of a, a situation? Call me because I don't know anything about any adoption scams in this agency. He's asking about adoption scams in the agency because we are the agency that does adoption. Within the agency. Not within the agency. Yeah, but they're taking but, place in the general public, but I'm asking for you for any guidance of any suggestion you may have of what the victims of these scams may how well, it depends, it depends on if it's a private adoption or a public adoption. We don't have bidding wars inside DCFS on kids getting placement. Now, let me be clear, there are, there are a lot of babies when they, or not babies, there are a lot of children that when they get freed for adoption, there may be 18 couples that are so excited and want to be on the list but the the couples don't even know who the other couples are, oh, right? And our social workers are evaluating each family and what's the best fit and what's the best match. Do they have other children? Would there be a sibling? Do they have a sibling that might also be freed for adoption that we know about and we wouldn't want to place this child with a family that only wants one when we know there's one behind them? Um, you know, is it a special needs child? So, short answer, tell them to call me. I don't, I don't know anything about that. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I will do that, because you just hit the nail on the head and point exactly what happened in the most high-profile one. The gentleman was trying to adopt the biological brother of a daughter that he had already adopted, mm -hmm. the social worker who's contracted. No speeches. I'm sorry. Yes. Who's You're giving me the story. CFS. We'll talk about it offline and okay, figure that out, okay? Because I really don't know about that story. Yes. Um, I think we have been hearing for a while from you, and I would say from corrections, that uh, morale is uh, very low. Uh, and I, I think you kind of hint at it sometimes, but do you think that was a, I mean, the short question is, why do you think that is? Do you think that was a leadership issue at DCFS? So the question is, do I think the morale issue being low was a leadership at DCFS? Yes, 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 it was. It was, it was from the top down. People weren't allowed to have opinions. They weren't allowed to fight back. They weren't allowed to challenge that this is not good practice. Those people were marginalized and often fired. So was it a leadership problem? You bet your bottom dollar. Do you think it was worse at DCFS than other agencies under the previous governor? I have no idea what was happening in another, what was it worse under DCFS or other agencies? I have no idea what was going on in other agencies um, during those years. All I know about is what I saw happen to an agency that I was very closely tied to, that my, um, life experience had been in, in totally enmeshed with and I took it extremely personally to see the agency that was an award-winning agency that people came from all over the country to see how we were doing child welfare to being an agency that I wouldn't send anybody to come look at us right now. Maybe somebody to come help us. Yes, to Kevin. I've already hinted this even just by the, the comment of smiling in the elevator, but then to what extent have you been able to reverse that course and what needs to happen yet further to help reverse that course? And what? I should have mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. please repeat the question. Please. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I'm repeating the question. Um, he's saying what else needs to happen? What have we done to reverse the course of this poor morale and what else can we do? So one thing that just happened that really helped was the 2% pay increase. Um, that it, for people that haven't had a raise in seven years, 2% may not feel like much, but it was something. It was a vote of confidence. It was a vote of saying we believe in you and we care about you and we're doing the best we can in bad situation. Um, I think we do a lot of things that seem kind of silly when I say them out loud, but we have employee appreciation stuff. You know, we have ice cream come. We, you know, I mean, literally, it's little, little things. It's nothing extravagant. You get to wear blue jeans if you pay five bucks. I mean, you know, we do teen spirit stuff where we raise money for prevent child abuse and the pinwheel challenge. 
it's, you know, competing against each other. The cars made a huge difference just because they felt heard. They felt valued. It, it, it just was one of the most infuriating things in the world to me that I couldn't find money in the budget, that it was so tight that I couldn't figure out how to buy the cars we needed. It just seemed ridiculous. It's the same with technology, but technology's expenses and two million dollars is a hit that I can't take. We just don't have that kind of money. And so it had to be special ask in the legislature to get that. And it's, it, it, I think it is the personal contact. We go see our staff, we're out in the field, we're walking the halls, we're talking to people. Our undersecretary, Eric Horan, who is here, Eric is all over the building. You can never find him. I have never been to Eric's office and found him in his office. He's all over the building talking to people and he comes in with this, in his charming French way and goes, did you know that on the third floor they have donuts for everybody? And I'm like, no, I did not know. And so, I mean, he's just everywhere and they love him. And it's just that personal, I came to visit. I came to talk to you. It's just being human and kind. And people are really, really responding to it. Yes, Lynn. Uh, we had some, we had some uh, there was some debate when, when uh, uh, my friend Maya Lowen was at the advocate and was trying to pin down exactly whether today's caseloads are violate some national norm or standard. Certainly, the feds are interested in, in, in that kind of issue. Uh, do you feel that do you feel that the, that that you're at the point in corrections they might say they have too many inmates to, to supervise properly and, and so on? Are you at the point where you're you feel that you're you're letting down your funders at the federal level as well as your families uh, with the system? He's asking, do we have, with the funding constraints that we have, are we meeting the federal standards or are we in danger of um, disappointing the feds in the work that we do? So there are federal standards for every single part of the child welfare system because it's not just that we call it child welfare, but it starts at intake at when the phone call comes in and then it goes to investigation and then it goes either it's accepted for invest for you know the family needs to come into foster care or they might go into family support and so it's a multi fragmented kind of um, sectioned work and in each section there's a caseload standard we are right now beginning the child and family service review that happens every six or seven years for every child welfare system, it is a huge national audit when the feds come in and they'll be with us. It takes them nine months, ten months to do this work. It's a long process. And they will look at every single part of the system and they'll see how far off national standards we are. And then we will get not penalized financially, but we'll go into a program improvement plan that we will then have to meet. This CSFR review, Child and Family Service Review, was designed by the feds in the early 2000s and it was designed to call attention to the fact that across the nation we don't treat children well. And no state passed. Every state failed the review. And that was intentional with the design of the review because they were hoping they would affect funding and um, program and quality and I don't know that that really helped. It didn't result in any great federal funding streams that were enhanced that came to the states. It may have heightened attention a little bit. We know that we're not meeting our own internal standards. A caseload um, for an investigator should be 10 new cases a month. Well, we've got investigators with 15, 16, 17 new cases a month. The caseload standard for a child, uh, a foster child, is 10 kids. The worker should have 10 children. We've got people with 18 kids. So we know we're way off our standard. When we, and under, and I keep going back to the Blanco years because I was here then, so that's my standard of measure. We were at our caseload standards then. We were doing really good work. We had an adequate number of people. There is great debate in the country. You hit on something very interesting. There's great debate in the country about how you slow entry into the system. 
And the only way you do that is tighten the restriction of what kind of case you will investigate. So if a call comes into the helpline and it's a case that would traditionally be labeled as neglect, because we're always going to go out on the severe abuse, right? If there's broken bones and people are hurt, then of course we're going to go. But if it's neglect and it's just the house is shabby and it doesn't look like there's enough food, is that a poverty issue or is that a neglect issue? We don't really know until you get there and find out if it's just because they're poor or if it's because they're drug addicts and they're not buying food, they're buying drugs and then the kids are truly being neglected. So how do you shut that door? How do you say, I'm only going to investigate this many people when I have the staff for this many? It is a trigger we have not pulled but it is a constant debate, and it's not just a debate in Louisiana. This is a struggle across the nation because there aren't a lot of child welfare systems that are really richly funded. That's it. That's it. Thank you all so much. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me. May I have your business cards? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you.